The fishes that are housed in this collection span hundreds of years and are not the effort of any one individual. Thousands of ichthyologists all across the entire planet have collected and contributed to the collection here at the UMMZ. Each fish represents originally an idea of one specific or several researchers working together to answer a question. These questions, while they have finished in their place and time and may have resulted in scientific publications, the specimens remain to be used by other researchers until the end of time. So in the collection, we have these jars arranged by family and within families by genera, and each one of the jars is identified by a catalog number. And that catalog number is absolutely essential because it's what allows us to know what to look for in the collection. We have close to a quarter million jars in this collection, so if you don't know what you're looking for, you're probably never going to be able to find it just by looking around. So we go straight to the, to the shelves and we look for those catalog numbers that allow us to identify the precise jar that we want to, to use. So a lot is a fundamental unit of the collection. It's the equivalent of a book in a library. And what it contains is every individual specimen of a single species collected at the same time, at the same site, during a field trip, for example. And the fundamental identifier of a lot is what we call the catalog number. We write it in this label that we will see in a minute, and we also write it at the top of the jar to make sure that we can find that catalog number that is equivalent to the GUI identifier of a book in a library as well. So let's look at what's inside. First of all, let's look at the label. The label contains the catalog number, in this case, University of Michigan Museum of Zoology, 250,996. But it also contains a lot of information. It tells us the family of the fishes that are contained in the, in the lot, what material or what substance they are preserved on, in this case, ethanol, which is the normal preservative for most of the specimens we have in the collection. It tells us the scientific name of the fish. It tells us the country where it came from, the district within the country, and the specific watershed where it came from. It tells us who collected it, when, and it tells us the relative size of the specimens, the, the smallest and the largest uh, specimen in the lot. It also gives us the field number, which is another fundamental number that refers us to the details of the environmental conditions under which the fishes were collected. That links us to the geographic location, to the type of environment where the fish were collected, and often to ecological conditions under the, the fish were collected. The specimens themselves add information to the, to the lot. In this case, we have two specimens. That's the, the whole contents of the lot. And as you can see, these two fishes are themselves tagged with their individual tag that has a different number. In this case, T01554 means this is tissue, tissue sample 1554 in the ichthyology collection at the UMMZ. And what it means is that we have taken a little bit of tissue sample, as you can see in this cut part of the specimen, to preserve it in ethanol and then in the liquid nitrogen facility so that we can do DNA analysis because the specimens are fixed in formaldehyde and formaldehyde damages DNA. So if we need to do DNA sequencing, we need to extract that tissue sample before we preserve the specimen in ethanol. So a very important component of the information we put in the labels for a lot is the so-called standard length. That is the fundamental way in which we measure size of a fish in ichthyology. In standard length always, regardless of the fish, is the distance between the tip of the upper jaw, right there, to the point in which the rays of the caudal fin insert into the body. In technical terms, that's the insertion of the caudal rays into the hyporal plates of the tail. In practice, we usually identify because if you wiggle the tail a little bit, you're going to see a little bit of a fold right here. So if you put the tip of your calipers in the fold, and then you go to the tip of the snout, we're seeing that this fish is 82.4 millimeters in standard length. And by convention, we also always measure standard length in millimeters. 
In other cases, for example, in a lot of fisheries uses, instead of standard length, people tend to use total length. And that is, again, from the tip of the upper jaw to the tip of the tail in this case. So it's going to give you a larger measurement of the same fish. So in this case, the total length of this fish is 106.2 millimeters. In some cases, for example, in which fishes have very modified tails and they don't really have a, a caudal fin, we sometimes also use total length instead of standard length because you just can't measure the standard length as usual. So this is a very special part of the collection that is a bit of a mini version of the larger collection. The fishes are organized in the same way, but these are fishes that have been treated in a very particular way. We call this our cleared and stained collection. As you can see here, the flesh of the fish has become nearly transparent. The bones are stained red and the cartilage is stained blue with special colorants. And these specimens are essential in our studies of anatomy. It's much better to study the relative position of bones and cartilage in a fish that you can see through and you can dissect in smaller parts than in the opaque specimen that is formed by our typical ethanol collection. So these fishes are very, very important in a lot of the anatomical work that we do for things like phylogenetics, that the use of morphology to place fossils in phylogenies, or even for analyses of biomechanics and functional morphology of, say, for example, feeding in different groups of fishes. Another important resource that museums like the U of MZ provide to the scientific community is the storage of what are called type specimens. When a researcher goes out and finds a new species, they describe it based on one individual called a holotype. This is also called a primary type. They also typically designate several secondary types, which in our case, we have a lot of paratypes. And the reason they pick multiple individuals um, that are the, you know, designated as paratypes is to describe and document the variation in a species and to provide backups if anything should happen to the holotype. Here at the UMMZ, we store our, our primary type specimens in special cabinets, isolated from the rest of the collection, so we can easily find them at any time. We also designate our primary type specimens with a red ribbon, and our secondary types are designated with a blue ribbon. This individual is a holotype of a loach collected in Southeast Asia, and this one individual is the representative of this species. So all species of Paracanthicobitus, all individuals of Paracanthicobitus triangulae are known and compared to this one individual. When we have very large fishes, they don't necessarily fit in a jar. And so we keep them in these stainless steel tanks that allow us to have much larger fishes that we would always be able to do. What Randy is pulling out right now is a North American gar. Our collection is particularly strong on North American fishes. So you can see a spotted gar right there. And another North American classic, a sturgeon right there. <laughs> and each specimen also comes with a tag that's either sewn or attached through other means that it usually has the scientific name, the tank number, which we have a special system for organizing our tanks, and the locality, and usually some size information or catalog numbers. And in this case, this number on this tag corresponds to a voucher list on the outside of the tank, which contains a catalog number, locality, collector, etc. We also store specimens that have been dried, um, similar to this strange beast, which is typically sold in strange gift shops all around the world as a mermaid or a sea monster. But in fact, it's actually a guitar fish, which is related to skates and stingrays. We also store components of fishes that are kept as trophies, like this sawfish rostrum, which is the basically the nose of a sawfish. What's really interesting is how long these things keep for. This particular rostra was collected in 1858, 
and was kept as a trophy. What's even more interesting is that researchers have developed a technique now to take skin samples from these to compare sawfishes living today to those living in the past from specifically materials like these that are stored in collections. In addition to the dried specimens, we also keep skeletal components. So things like shark jaws. So these are carefully dissected out from a shark specimen in order to keep the teeth and jaw structure together for researchers to use because a lot of what shark biologists use are teeth when it comes to shark biology. And finally, we also store skeletal material, disarticulated skeletons of specimens inside boxes. So this box would be similar to the jars that we've already seen in the collection in that you have a specimen inside of a container. It contains a catalog number, the genus and species, information about the locality, who collected it, and when. And if you open up the box, you see that you have skeletal components which have been prepared using flesh-eating beetles. So they take this the specimen, dissect out as much as possible, and then the beetles consume the flesh on the skeleton. And in this case, we have a bow fin, and we have a skull in a, in a spinal column from this fish that was collected. And you can look at all the same types of things that you would in a clear and stained specimen or whatever. So one of the things that are interesting and important that we have in the collection are what we call the ecological collections. For example, this aisle contains some of the specimens that have been collected by the Institute of Fisheries Research, which is a collaboration between the Fish Division and the Museum of Zoology and the Herbarium and the Department of Natural Resources of Michigan. They have been monitoring Michigan watersheds for close to 100 years collecting fishes, collecting aquatic plants, collecting environmental data. And a lot of the voucher specimens for those collections come here to the museum. And today they represent an ongoing research uh, project that, that we're all collaborating on to try to understand environmental change in Michigan over the last century across its watersheds. On behalf of myself and Dr. Lopez Fernandez, we'd like to thank you for visiting the UMMZ Fish Collection. If you'd like to know more about our collection, you can visit our website at lsa.umich.edu slash UMMZ slash fishes slash collections. Or you can drop an email to either myself or Dr. Lopez Fernandez, and we'd be happy to help you 